Human Alien Queen Origins, the first human queen monstrous merger that will create a new era of xenomorphs. H.R. Giger's Xenomorph is an impeccable visual embodiment of existential dread. It is the quintessential horror that transcends beyond just the fear of death or the inexplicable, but rather embodies an all-encompassing terror of losing everything that one holds dear. Despite many apprehensions, Marvel seems to be doing a good job with the Alien franchise in rewriting that fear, the claustrophobia and the paranoia related to the biometallic monsters. One such comic book was the 2022 comic Alien Icarus, which revolves around a nuclear disaster that threatens the entire human population of the United Systems. The only hope for survival lies in an anti-radiation biotech synthesized from xenomorphs and left behind on a hostile planet. And so to retrieve it, a special ops team of synthetics called the Steel Team is chosen for the mission. As the events unfold, we see the most horrific and perfect blend of a xenomorph queen and a human. So without further ado, let us embark on this thrilling adventure. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us it means a lot. Thank you. Now, let's begin. Steel Team At the dawn of the 23rd century, both the American continents, most of Europe, China and a few independent space colonies came together to form a union of states called the United Systems, which served as the most powerful and influential political power at the time. The United Systems ran 25 colonies and accounted for almost 1.4 billion people. Furthermore, the agricultural complex on a planet named Demeter II was the biggest of all of these colonies, but more importantly, it was the economic backbone of the United Systems systems as a whole. However, two weeks before the events of Icarus, an experimental nuclear reactor on Demeter II suffered a catastrophic failure. The radiation could not be counteracted with the usual treatments, so essentially it was a death sentence for anyone who was exposed. The United Systems military evacuated everyone that they possibly could, but a billion people were still stuck on the planet. Adding to the United Systems woes was the fact that a systemic famine was to follow, and it would, in turn, create an economic collapse of all of the 25 worlds that the United Systems governed. So how did the Steel Team get involved? Well, that's what we're here to find out. The small and ostracized group of unkillable synthetics was living on an exomoon called Europa 5. Led by a synthetic named Freya, the group was spending its days in the idyllic environment when Freya found herself under attack. She dodged it like the pro that she was before alerting her synthetic friends about the attack. The organics have found us, multiple hitters, using non-lethal charges. They want us alive. Within no time, the synthetics Nora, Seth, Ellie, and Astrid were on high alert. But although the human soldiers did not wish to destroy the synthetics, it was a bloodbath for the humans. They also found short-range comms, which meant that the communication base had to be nearby, and knowing the area reasonably well, they figured it would be down by the riverbank clearing. It was at that base, the synthetics found Lieutenant General George March, who was heading up the op. Freya and the others were under the opinion that General March was there to capture them, but on the contrary, he was there to seek their help. The synthetics have a hard time believing March, and there was good reason behind this. The government had the steel team carry out some insane operations, and when the time came to honour their promises, United Systems had backed out. Naturally, the synths went rogue and made Europa 5 their home. The general tells them about what has happened on Demeter 2, and also reveals that the only solution rests millions of miles away on Tobler 9. But what was Tobler 9? Well, Tobler 9 was where Wayland Utani developed projects that could never have been gotten away with on Earth. Chemical weapons, bioweapons, nanotech pathology, extra human gene splicing, truly horrific stuff. According to United Systems Military Intel, one of the Wayland Utani secret projects was a chemical for their agents. One injection with this could grant the subject a variety of benefits, including the ability to sustain deadly radiation levels. Naturally, this serum could save a billion lives, so what was the catch? As it happened, Tobler 9 was overrun by xenomorphs, and a human squad wouldn't last there for 30 seconds. But xenomorphs seemed to ignore the presence of synthetics in their vicinity, and that is where the Steel Team came in. The synths didn't wish to go on another mission, given that the humans had a bad track record with them. But March tells them that if they did the mission, Congress would allow synthetics to become full citizens of the United Systems. Freya agrees to the deal and asks, if we do it, what exactly are we looking for down there? To which March replies, according to our records, the company synthesized part of their biologic from the organism, an embryo or something, some kind of alien egg. Are we surprised? No, of course not. Nothing organic ever tangled with us and walked away. 
The following issue starts on a spacecraft en route to Tobler 9 and was carrying March and the synthetics. Once considered the very jewel of the Wayland Yutani Corporation, Tobler 9 was now a giant irradiated wasteland. March tells them that they would find the egg in the underground industrial complex of the facility, but he understands the danger that thrives in a place on which he would probably never set foot. He warns the five synthetics, whatever you find down there, don't take a single step or open a single door that you don't have to. Steel Team left the mothership on a landing shuttle and flew through some rough weather to set foot on Tobler 9, the hell in space. They soon found sinkholes and a collapsed transit line that could lead them into the industrial complex. As Steel Team moved forward, Ellie and Seth got into a slight argument about humanity and their methods. While Seth thought that humans only strive for knowledge and to increase their personal capabilities, Ellie felt disgusted by humans and blamed them for everything that ever went wrong. Nevertheless, the team reached its destination and found that the radiation levels were off the chart. Interesting enough, the comic makes several references to another arc called Alien Revival, another comic that we're going to explore quite soon. Gradually, the team found itself inside the infamous bioweapons division of Wayland Utani, now left dark and desolate, as if it was a bride abandoned by her fiancé on the wedding day. The egg was supposed to be inside a vault, and it seemed that their job was about done. However, they didn't know that this was a six-issue comic. As soon as the vault was opened, Steel Team was left in shock because the egg chamber had been breached. It was empty. Ellie suggested that they abandon the mission, but Freya knew that if they turned back, the future of all synthetics would be at risk. She asked her team to look for anything that could help them find the egg, which is when Nora found genetically modified insects. Just by looking at them, you could understand that these things had xenomorph DNA in them. Right around this time, the synthetics hear strange noises coming from a distance, so they follow it, only to find a super massive xenomorph hive. Clearly, the planet was not bereft of life, and it wasn't long before a nasty brood of xenomorphs ambushed the synthetics. These creatures didn't usually attack synths unless they felt threatened, but they probably smelled George March, a human, on the synths. The first victim of this assault was Seth, the seemingly good guy. But don't worry, he's not dead yet. Steel Team showed the xenomorphs what they're made of and butchered the biometallic creatures like a ninja slicing fruit with his katana. But five synths were not really a match for innumerable killing machines, right? Just as the five of them were about to lose hope, they found that someone was incinerating the xenomorphs. It was humans. Friends or foes? Humans were not supposed to survive in the extreme radiation levels, and if that wasn't enough, there were hordes of xenomorphs. So how did a small colony of humans manage to fight the odds and live? We'll find out soon. So the humans led the synthetics to safety, but it seems that they've lost a bit of their humanity. Not only have they become extremely potent in killing xenomorphs in cold blood, but they're also taking trophies of their victims. It was as if these survivors had accepted that they were just animals. They all reach what used to be Wayland Utani's Capital Utilities and Maintenance Complex. The organics were led by a lady named Melody. She reveals how she and the others at Wayland Utani hated and feared the Steel Team back in the day when Tobler 9 was still active. But there were things far worse than the synthetic special forces now. Freya meets a young deaf boy and tries to cheer him up, but Ellie doesn't seem to be happy about it and asks Freya not to pick up pets on a mission. Eli then goes to check on his gear and finds a woman named Lee going through it. As Lee starts to leave, Ellie stops her, accusing her of breaking one of his cases. When Lee asks what was in the case, Ellie told her that a genetically engineered insect was sitting on her clothes. But then he stopped and he told her, no, it was just a mistake. You see, this guy absolutely hates humans. And it's a bit of a dream come true for him to kill a human without even having to move a muscle himself. So unaware of the alien insect, Lee went about her business. Meanwhile, Freya briefs Melody about the mission objective. The serum itself had been destroyed back when Tobler 9 was turned into a nuclear war zone. But Freya and the others were here for the raw material, the ovomorph, from which the biologic was synthesized. But Melody already knew all this. Melody also reveals that the Ovomorph in the vault hatched a long time ago. There's no scarcity of eggs on Tobler 9, but getting one of those bad boys was the real deal. Freya requests Melody take the synths to the eggs in return for a ride for all the survivors to somewhere safe. And of course, Melody agrees. When the next storm hit Tobler 9 two days later, they made their move. Interestingly, the rain itself was radioactive, and although it made the humans sicker, it washed their tracks. So I guess better sick than dead. Melody points the steel team in the direction of the High Point Rail Station, which now serves as the largest hive of xenomorphs. And of course, where there's a hive, there's a queen. 
under Melody's lead, they inch closer and closer to the hive because it's impossible to get an overmorph otherwise. And if they really wanted one, they would also have to kill the queen through marshes and concrete woods. They walked and walked, but of course there's something else that was happening as well. Lee had accompanied the team and it seemed the insect had done its job on her. She was trembling and fumbling like a newborn baby when they reached their destination. As would have been expected, the xenomorphs surround them from all angles. As the steel team struggles against the aliens, the humans fall back. Ellie was proven right once again. Humans had screwed the synths over yet again. But before they had the time to get over the shock of betrayal, the synths hear a screech that plunges them into the fear of destruction. And of course it was the Xenomorph Queen. The future of warfare. Melody had closed the gate behind her and that was the only escape. The synths tried to fend off the Xenomorph Queen while the others battled the drones. Nora tried to take on the Queen herself and Seth was charged with reopening the gate so that they could make their escape and come back for the egg another time. Somehow they did manage to get away from the biometallic minions of hell but unfortunately Nora lost her life. Seth and Nora had been in love and in a desperate attempt to mourn her loss he gouged out his own eyes. Ellie clearly pissed off, left for the bunker to kill every last human. Meanwhile, Melody, Lee and a human pilot named Brittle reached the synth aircraft so that they could fly to the bunker, retrieve the other humans and then leave Tobler 9 for good. But Lee's condition had become a lot worse. Her skin was peeling off in places and she was vomiting black goo. She had mutated beyond repair and even smashed in Melody's face with a stroke of her tongue which was now elongated. This results in Brittle shooting at whatever remains of Lee and the next thing we know, that aircraft has crashed down below. Out of the burning wreckage comes a humanoid figure. It wasn't human anymore, but it used to be one. And Freya understands that this was the girl that Ellie had spoken with and when she asks him if he knew anything about it, Ellie doesn't waste a single moment in conceding that yes, he had set one of the organisms against another one in a horrific and novice move. The synths had to go back to the bunker for two reasons. One, there were children inside the bunker. And two, General March had given them a home beacon, which was present in the bunker along with the rest of the steel team gear. Meanwhile, the mutated Lee reaches the bunker and those inside let her in because they notice her ID chip. But all hell breaks loose, of course, because it wasn't really Lee who had come back. She'd brought the xenomorphs along as well and, as you would expect, the chaos that ensues was drenched in red. Death in the family. Steel Team managed to rescue the mute kid and secure the beacon, but everyone else, including Seth, was lost. He lost his life in a nuclear blast. However, Lee had managed to survive this yet again. She soon made her way to the Xenomorph Queen and stood before her as if she was trying to communicate with or even command the Queen. Meanwhile, the synthetics realize that the kid they've rescued should have started to show signs of weakness and sickness because of the close proximity to the nuclear blast, but he was fine. They deduce that the survivors of Tobler 9 have been taking the serum that, that Wayland Yutani had designed for its staff, and now it was evident they didn't need to take any xenomorph eggs back to the United Systems. All they needed was this kid, since he was the key to the serum. They hadn't quite gathered themselves after the shock of losing Nora and Seth when the xenomorph queen and her brood attack once again, and this time the red haired synth named Astrid was the victim. Freya escaped with the kid only to find innumerable overmorphs down below. She hands the little guy a pistol to defend himself with, but it seems that she was going to fail the boy. Ellie had finally returned and he threw the kid down into the midst of the Overmorphs. Sensing the presence of life in their vicinity, the Overmorphs started to become active and to make things worse, with the Queen not far away. Better worlds. Freya and Ellie break into a fight. Both of them had their sets of reasons for fighting one another, while Ellie believed that every human should be killed for betraying him at different points in his robotic life. Freya had become more humane than most humans. She was willing to fight a friend to save a young human boy and even die trying. As the two battle each other with words and fists, the young mute boy was probably breathing his last. But Freya emerges victorious when she sticks a blade into Ellie's eyeball, pushing it through his skull to the other side. She then plunges down to the boy and struck the drone surrounding him with a sword that Nora had left behind before she perished. But it was now the Queen that Freya was facing and the Queen was no easy target. But before the Queen could finish Freya off, Eli shoots her down apparently because he wasn't done with her yet. It seems this guy is on a whole different level, even for a sociopathic synthetic. Meanwhile, that young boy was running for his life, with newly hatched facehuggers pursuing him. One of them almost does attach itself to his face, but Freya thankfully is there once again, reaching him just in time to pull the creature away. Ultimately, Freya did know that she had to kill the queen if she wanted to survive, but more importantly, slaying the queen was indispensable for the young boy's safety. And after an intense battle, Freya did, in fact, succeed. Back on the mothership, Lieutenant General George March was showing his true colours. 
as he revealed that neither he nor any of the politicians had any interest in treating the synthetics as equals. In his own words, Synths are expensive toys with delusions of grandeur. The best way to deal with them is to play along, let them go on thinking they're people. However, this guy is soon going to learn a lesson. His team triangulated the beacon that they had given to the synths and they landed at the place the signal was coming from. As they, upon walking from their ship, they're met by Lee, whose mutation had further exacerbated. And by now Freya and the child had also reached March's aircraft, only to witness him and his men being absolutely slaughtered by the abomination. But again, Eli arrives just in time to help Freya and her newfound ward fight off the aliens. Against all odds, they manage to get aboard March's ship and take off with the child in tow. Ellie's opinion about humans had not changed, but he agreed with Freya when he said that this kid could be raised in a better fashion than how his family was raising him. But as they fly ever further away from Tobler 9, Lee changes into something far worse than before. She is becoming a perfect bridge between humans and xenomorphs, and the question we should ask is, what side will she take? Marvelous verdict. The new human xenomorph queen, in the form of a mutated Lee, with her dark, twisted appearance and insidious nature, strikes at the very core of our deepest fears. She's a haunting presence that lingers long after the last panel ends, leaving us with an eerie sense of unease that we can't quite shake off. At its core, Alien isn't just a horror franchise, but a masterful exploration of the human condition. It taps into our primal instincts and fears, exposing our vulnerabilities and our capacity for both bravery and cowardice. It's a story that resonates with us on a visceral level, leaving us questioning our own mortality and the fragility of existence. In short, Alien is a true masterpiece of cinema, a timeless classic, and it will continue to haunt and inspire audiences for generations to come. We are hopeful about what Marvel can do with this franchise. What about you? Leave your thoughts down in the comments section below. We'd love to hear them. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't done so already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone.